As a matter of fact, people ask me this question, where are we in the Messianic roadmap? When is Mashiach will come? Okay? And I'm going to tell you where exactly where we are. We are in, in a mode now, right now, that I call the resurrection mode. The resurrection of our, our people as they return. You know, I recall when I was growing up in Israel, I didn't even know what Messianic Jew was. They had a summer camp just recently here in Israel. You had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids in the age of 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. All in fire for, for, for Mashiach. What do you think is going to happen to the next generation? They're going to grow up to become our lawyers and police officers and Knesset members. And maybe God will, one of them will actually will be our next prime minister. We are in a revival mode. And this weekend, when Rabbi Steve called me, I said, I'm going to come, but I don't want to come to teach. I want to come so we can experience revival together. Now, I want to tell you something. How many of you visited in Israel before? How many of you drove in Israel before? And you're still with us. Congratulations. <laughs> But in Israel, we have what's called the shuk. Anybody want to know what the shuk is? It's the market, right? The marketplace. And here's the problem. When you walk to the shuk, the very first thing you walk into a shuk in Jerusalem, there, it's the bagel stand. And I'm going to tell you something. The same guy was there. I think he was there during the time of Mashiach. It's the same guy sitting there. And he's going to let you know that his bagels are the best bagels. But you look at the bagel, and you see the flies on the bagel. And you know it's been sitting there all day, but for him, oh, he chased after you with a bagel. Come, it's the best bagels. There is something authentic in this. Do you agree with me? In his mind, he has the best bagel in town. Yes? You know it's rotten. But he has the big. There is authenticity to what he sells. I want to tell you something. We are in sales and marketing. And we're in sales and marketing in the name of Yeshua. And you cannot sell something you do not have. You hear me? You cannot sell something that is fake, not to the Jewish people. So I pray that this weekend will be a weekend not about me, but about you about your relationship with Mashiach. These messages will, will be progressive as we go through, uh, through this weekend. Now, there is something to say about authenticity. Especially, you know, we minister to Israelis, a lot to Israelis. They can detect fraud. Recently, <clears throat> I gave a message to uh, a large crowd of maybe about 50 Israelis. I gave the entire salvation message, and part of the salvation message I gave them was about uh, Yom Kippur. So they come to me all after the service and say, hmm, so you drove in Yom Kippur. I said, I just gave you a message for one hour, and that's all what you got from the message, that I drove in Yom Kippur to get to shul? <laughs> you see, people have a way to detect something that is, uh, uh, is, is funny about this. I travel all over the country, all over the world, sharing the message of Yeshua. Because it's a message that changed my life. How many of you believe that this message changed your life? Amen. So how much more should we do for something that changed our life? Matter of fact, it says this in Romans 13. It says, but put on. Put on Adon Yeshua. Dress yourself as Yeshua. Put on Adon Yeshua Mashiach. And make no provision for the flesh. Wherever Yeshua lives, there is no flesh. I tell you something, it is hard. Our ministry have been attacked, personal attacks that you would not even imagine. Just, just, just a few days ago, uh, in the anticipation of the book, The Return of the Kosher Pig, we receive an email that says, wait, we have a big surprise for you when you come to Israel this August. I don't want to say names, but you know, you, can, you know, and I know who they are. But I'm going to tell you something. God is greater and God is bigger than anybody who stands to the God of Israel. And Yeshua is Lord. 
and his name will be held. But I want to tell you something. On, on Sunday, we'll get together with the Jewish community, and I pray many will come, and I pray you will be partners in that, in bringing them. And we do not really have to um, ask the question, uh, who, is, um, who is the Mashiach to them? I'll tell you why. Uh, about a year ago, I entered to a conservative synagogue in my local hometown, maybe, maybe more than a year, two years, almost two years ago. It was in Yom HaShoah, you know, the Holocaust Memorial Day. And the rabbi saw me from the corner of the eyes, and he came in here, and he said, so you are the rabbi of the Messianics. Half of the place was filled with Messianic Jews in a conservative synagogue. Oh, what an awesome thing that is. And I asked him, and I said, yes, I am. He said, oh, so you are, you are the one that, that spread all this heresy. I said, yes, I am, if you want to call it that. And he said, let me tell you my problem with this. I said, what is your problem? And here we are in Yom HaShoah, and he pulled his phone, and he asked me, do you like the music? You like some music? I, like, I love music. Who doesn't? He said, who's the greatest band that ever lived? I said, hmm, that's a trick question. I better think carefully. The Beatles? You're correct, he says to me. And he pulled the phone and he said, you know what is the best Beatles song ever, uh, ever heard? I said, all you need is love? No. I know. Hey, Jude. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Let it be. No. And then he pulled the phone. He go to the pulpit and he put the phone to the entire synagogue to here in Yom HaShoah. And anybody want to guess what song it was? It was twist and shout. And he shouted to me, you see, this is who you are. You twist the truth of the Hebrew scripture and you shout it in our face. That's who you are. That's all what Messianic Jews are. Twister of the truth and shaker. What I'm trying to tell you is the Jewish people see the Mashiach. The question I want you to take from today, because... because I'm probably not going to get to my message, uh, as I see, uh, is this question. What Yeshua do we want the Jewish community to see? The hypocritical Yeshua? The judgmental Yeshua? The Yeshua that doesn't care? Or do we want them to see Yeshua for who he was? They're going to see Yeshua. Which Yeshua they're going to see is the question that we must answer by our conduct. Matter of fact, there was an amazing article by USA Today just released titled America for Gods. Look it up. Now it's been released to a book. And, and, and basically, they ask this question, how does Americans view God? Okay? And here, here, here it's, I would like to, to read to you uh, the statistics from this article. This is in USA Today. It says that 28% of Americans... And this is, they did it among believers, Christians, those who proclaim to be Christian. 28% of Americans believe in authoritative God. And what it is mean by authoritative, authoritative God is someone who has an author, uh, somebody who, who, who is, uh, uh, is very judgmental, yet he's engaging the world. He's engaging the world, but he is very harsh upon the world. Okay? And not the 25 percent of Americans view God so you're getting now to 28 plus 25 that's 53 percent of America they view God as just plain a critical God he is a critical God who is removed from daily events but will render uh, render a judgment in afterlife basically he created everything he judges but he doesn't care and then there, there, there is another God in this article called a distant God. 20% of Americans, or actually 23% of Americans believe in a distant God. This is a God who created, the, put the, the universe in motion, but he disengaged all together. If you put the number together, 78% of Americans believe in a God that, that created everything, but he doesn't, yeah, he, he's either critical or judgmental about the world, or he's just distant. The question that we must ask ourselves is why are we even in this movement to begin with? And I'm going to tell you the answer. It's not to learn Hebrew dances. 
It's not to learn the Hebrew language. It is for one reason only. To line ourselves with the word of God. Amen. And here's what the word of God says. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 5 and 6. He says that he will gather his people from the corner of the earth. The word in, in Hebrew is nitre aretz. God is literally saying in our in own language, he wants to go to the end of the world to bring his people back. And this is our agenda. To see our people coming back. In Judaism, we have this concept, and I'm going to teach you a little bit about uh, uh, Jewish uh, 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 theology. No, I was raised up in observant Jewish home. And the idea in Judaism is that Mashiach is ready today to return, okay? In essence, when there are enough people who come back to Mashiach, to, to God, Mashiach will appear. It even says in the Talmud, in the Shabbat tractate, that when all Jews celebrate one Shabbat together, Messiah will appear. Now, it sounds to you weird, but isn't that what Yeshua actually said? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I long to gather you like a hand that gathered a cheek, but you were not willing. Your house will left desolate. You will not see me again until you say what? Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. In essence, Yeshua said, I am ready. But not enough what they call in Judaism, sparks have returned. We read this Hasidic story that go like that. A king lost. This is, this is, this is a Hasidic proverb. I would like to read it to you. He says, a king uh, lost a costly pearl. He sent out his three, uh, his three sons to find this costly pearl. The first sent out, glad to be free from the restraint of his father's presence. He, he, he cared neither for the pearl nor for his father. He never returned, but spent his life following his own pleasure. The second, set, the second one went forward, made a hasty search, and quickly returned to his father's house. Not because he so greatly loved his father, but because he was lot to be away so long from the comfort of his home. Now the turn set out full of soul at leaving his home and his beloved father, but determined, notwithstanding all his own suffering and separation, to stay away and make diligence, search until, un, until he should find the pearl, because he knows what great joy the finding of it would give to his father. One man is altogether absorbed with the things of the world, Another is eager to please God, not out of love for him, but because he is afraid to lose the future bliss of paradise. But there are some men who love God for his own sake and search for the divine sparks, that the, the Jewish soul, the souls, which are scattered all over the world in, in man and nature and try to bring them back to the source. Man has been created by God in order that he may finish what God has deliberately, and I like to stress the word deliberately, left unfinished. Not that God needs our help or the help of his creatures, but it is his love which causes us to impart his own nature to the work of his hand in order that man should have the privilege. I mean, if you believe we are privileged today. Do not take Shoresh David for, for granted. You are privileged. By the way, if you're from the nations, you're not Jewish. You are privileged to take part of it. What an awesome thing. Privilege and joy of becoming his fellow worker in his world and in natural as well as in the spiritual life. The, those sparks that are lurking in darkness is nothing more than our Jewish people. Now, I want to encourage us today. I really feel this burdening upon, upon my heart to tell you this. Sometimes we look upon ourselves and say, we're not good enough. We're not holy enough. We're not righteous enough. Oh, I just had a fight with my wife on the way here. How can I be a lie to anybody? How many of you like to work out? Come on. You, some of you look at me funny. I didn't ask a funny question. How many of you like to work out? Okay. You are the weird ones. We'll take you out. I like to work out in the dream. 
You know what I mean? <laughs> Going from the refrigerator to the couch. That's why I need to lose a few pounds. Yes? But the point of the matter is, exercise is hard. So many times, I put my shorts, and you know, I have all the equipment, I have the band, and, and I have the special what? I even have, I even have a shoes that track how many steps I do. You know that? I have the bells and whistles. But I don't do this. But I want to tell you something. If I don't do it, I don't lose the calories, right? Right? But I want to tell you something, brother. This is not the way God works. This is not the way our God works at all. Let me see. Let's see how God works. Here's what it says in Parashat Kedushim, in Leviticus. Okay? Parashat Kedushim, Leviticus 20, verse 7. He says, Vahit kadashtem, vahitem kedoshim ki ani Hashem Elohechem. Now, why this is important? You read it in English, it doesn't really make sense. It's just sanctify yourself because I'm sanctified. But that is is missing what God is saying altogether. This is not what God is saying altogether. God is saying here, as you began the process of wanting to become holy, okay, you hear what I'm saying? As you began the process, you are not holy, but as you began with your desire, you see the word is kadash in there, it's a procedure, it's a process. That's why I use the, 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 the term Hitkadash. As you just have the thought of going to the gym, it is already like you ran 15 miles in the eyes of God. How many of you are excited about that? Am I the only one excited that I don't actually have to go to the gym? Matter of fact, in the eyes of the Lord, we are already winners. Before we even ran the race. Yeah. You want to talk about grace in the Torah? This is grace. I want to give you a word of encouragement today. God have you. If you're sitting here today. He have you in a purpose to be here on Friday night. June 14th. In this place. God have a plan for you. If you're part of Shoresh David. God has a plan for you. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't even matter for that purpose if you're a Jew or a Gentile. God has a process that he wants you to go. And as you just stand as Isaiah and say, Hineni, Hineni, here I am, here I am. It's already as you won the race. Amen. Matter of fact, we see this prayer that we probably will say tomorrow. It's Chaimi, right? It's Chaimi, right? Everybody know that. What is this prayer actually saying? I want you to look at the second verse for a second. He said, she is a tree of life. To who? who those who, lay, who take hold of her. Right? Now, it's not going to be a tree of life to everybody. The world going to look at you and say, you're crazy. Why are you doing this? Why are you keeping the Torah? Why are you doing the mitzvot? Why are you living a Messiah-centered life? You can have good time. The world will not understand it. But for those who hold on, her, hold on to her, it will be life. By the way, you want to know whether or not you observe Torah properly or not? Or not? It's simple. There's a verse actually in the Talmud that says the following. If you exercise a Torah for its own sake, it will lead to life. However, if you exercise Torah not for its own sake, it surely lead to your chopping of your head. And you know what is mean for, so the million dollar question, what does it mean for its own sake, right? That's the million, million dollar question. What it's mean is very simply for its own sake, it's going God back, it's quoting Deuteronomy chapter 30, it says, um love and you circumcise your heart. Ask yourself the question, whatever you do externally or internally, does it bring you closer to Mashiach? or away from him. If it's bring you closer, you exercise Torah properly. But if it bring you away from it, it is the wrong Torah. But I want you to pay attention to the second part of the verse. Utomchea meushar. It's translated happy. Happy is everyone that supported. That's not what it says. 
How many of you believe today that Yeshua supports you? How many of you believe in this room that Yeshua is the author of your life today? Okay, how many of you also believe that you are in a covenant? You are in a covenant? So in a covenant there are two sides, right? There are two sides in a covenant. The word here in Hebrew, Tomchea, means those who support her. You and I must support the gospel. Okay? A gospel without people to take the gospel is not much of a gospel because there's nobody to take the gospel. I know it's a different way to think about it, but this is the way Jewish people view covenants. Both sides have part to play in it. Thanks God that God's side is 99.99 and my side is 1%, but I still have them 1%. And what is my 1%? To put on Mashiach and support the message. And matter of fact, this is what the Torah is all about this Shabbat. There is a verse in the Torah I want us to look very carefully. It's deal with this process of sanctification that we talk about, about supporting the message, etc., etc. We read in the Torah this, this Shabbat in the parasha, and it says, And the Lord spoke unto Moshe, saying, Take the rod and assemble the congregation thou and Aaron thy brother and speak unto the rock before thy, thy, their eyes. And it is given forth water and thou shalt bring forth to them uh, water out of the rock so thou shalt give the congregation and the cattle drink. And Moses took the rod before the Lord, commanded him, and Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock and they said unto them hi here now you rebels how do you bring forth water out of the rock and Moshe lifted up his hands smote the rock with the rod twice and the water came forth abundantly and the congregation drank and their cattle and the Lord says unto Moshe and Aaron because you believe not in me to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel what is then continue I think I cut it what he said you will not bring this, these people into the land. Somebody, it struck anybody is odd here? What is going on? I read this scripture hundreds of times over the years and I could not understand for the life of me why God was so angry with Moshe. It seems like he got the gist. It seems like everybody got water. Shouldn't it just say Zangizunt? Everybody happy? Let's celebrate. Sound to me, work for me. There's water. This, this, this. But there is a clue for this, and there is an important, what I could like to call a kingdom principle that I want you to take. Because this is a truly a kingdom principle. Everybody still with me? Okay. I want to make sure. The clue for this comes in verse 12. It says here in the Hebrew, Lo emantem bi. You did not believe in me. Okay? The action that Moshe did has not brought God forward. Okay? I want you to pay attention for a second for verse 8. What did he ask him to do? Is to take... What he asked him to do, take the, take, take the rod, and what to do? Vadibartem el asela. Vadibartem el asela. I want you to pay attention because, you know, I don't know how many of you, how many of you know something about Hebrew here? Okay? Hebrew is a dynamic and complex language that has multiple meanings. The word has multiple meanings. It's like a, a multidimensional jigsaw puzzle. There is an important word here in this text that will tell us why God was so angry with Moshe. It is not because he hit it, because there's something else going on. The word here that I want you to put, pay attention to is the word vedibartem. The word divartem is, is actually um, rooted in the Hebrew word davar. Everybody can say with me davar. davar. The word davar is actually uh, derived 
from Aramaic word, there's an Aramaic word called Mimra. A Mimra is equivalent, okay, to the word Davar in Hebrew, and it's all also the, the English word, the word, okay? Matter of fact, there is a Hebrew prayer that go like that, Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Sheakol Nesa Bidvaro. This is a grace prayer. This is a prayer for grace. You do it with the meal. And it says, Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who make everything by who? By his word. How God created everything? He created everything by his word. Now, how many of you like old British shows? You know, there's a show I love. You don't know what you're missing here in America, but I'll help you. There's a show called Time Tunnel. Anybody ever watched Time Tunnel? It's about two British scientists that, that go to a time machine, okay? And somehow they got stuck in a, like a hole, and they can never come back home. So they go from time to time, from time to time, to era to era. Wouldn't it be great if we had this kind of time machine? Where would you go to? I would go back to the time of Yeshua, sit down with Yeshua, speak to him, speak to Shaul, straighten the entire thing with Galatians, Acts 15, I straighten it all up, come back with the answers, I guess we're all happy. Wouldn't that be great? Well, what if I tell you we can do that? We can do that. And if you come tomorrow to the Yeshua, you'll see how we can do that. In fact, the very, the very earliest translation of the Bible that used today but in every Orthodox uh, synagogue uh, uh, for the Torah called Targum Onkolos. Onkolos, shockingly, was not Jewish. So you have hope. Maybe you can write the next translation of the Bible if you're not Jewish. Uh, but Onkolos, his translation is what considered a Lachic translation of the Torah. Okay? And what word did he use here? We'll see in a second. What about Isaiah 53, for example? Well, we can go to Targum Yonatan and see how Jews exactly read it in the, in, in, in the first century. There's no ambiguity. You understand? We can go back and see exactly what is being said. And a matter of fact, there is a couple of things in the Targumim. We learn. I'll give you an example. Let's, do a, uh, let's play a little game. When Adam and Eve walk in the garden... Yes, everybody remember Adam and Eve? They heard a voice, shouted them, the word, Echa. By the way, God said, how could you do it to me? God was weeping. What voice did they hear? The voice of who? How do you know it's Yeshua? How do we know? Well, actually, it doesn't say. It says your Bible says the Lord. But let's know how the Targum says this. Look what the Targum says. It says in Hebrew, and they heard the voice of Mimra. And who is Mimra? Mimra is the Davar. They heard the voice of the Word. They heard the Word. The Word was speaking to them. Here's another example. It says that Abraham believed and it's counted him as what? Righteous. It is Abraham believing the Lord and it's counted him as righteous. Well, look what the, the, the Targum says. The Targum said, and, and, and he believed in the Mimra, and it's counting him as righteousness. This is very important, because who is the Mimra? The Mimra is the Davar. And who is the Davar? We'll see in a second. Matter of fact, I, I, for sake of time, I'll just give you a few examples. The Mimra speak to humans in Genesis 3.8. The Mimra punishing the wicked according to, to Genesis 3.8. 18.1, the Mimra is our Savior, according to Exodus 17.21, and is our Redeemer, according to Deuteronomy 32.21. Why this is important? Because the word that is used here, the Dibartim, the Davar, is the Mimra. It is a manifestation of God. The Dibartim El Asela. It represents something much more than that. There is one place that, we, that if we go to scriptures, we can find a connection. So, so if the Mimra is actually yud hey vav hey, sim yud hey vav hey clearly is. Could he also be the Mashiach himself? Well, in Yohanan 1.1 to 1.5, it says, Bereshit haya adavar. 
והדבר היה אלוהים, ואלוהים היה הדבר. In the beginning was the word, who is the word? The דבר. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Do you understand what, is, what I am telling you? The reason God was upset in the Torah portion is because the Davar was not spoken. And who is the Davar? It's the Mashiach himself. How do we know this? The famous Jewish theologian by the name of Daniel Berain. How many of you read the Jewish Gospels by Daniel Berain? A leading Talmudist in the world. Here is what he had to say. This is not a messianic. Let me claim again. He is not a messianic Jew. But here is what he had to say about John 1.1. He said, in light of the evidence, the fourth gospel is not a new departure in the history of Judaism. In the use of the logos, logos, the davar theology. But only if even this, it is incarnational Christology. John 1.1 to John 1.5 is not a hymn, but it's a midrash. It's a sermon. That is, it is not a poem, but it's a homely explanation of Genesis 1.1 to 1.5. The very first words in the gospel, in the beginning, Bereshit, show that creation is the focus of the text. The rest of the prologue show that the midrash of the logos is applies to appearance of Yeshua. Do you understand what he's saying? He's saying that Genesis, John 1, 1 to 1, 5 is a parallel to Bereshit 1, 1 to 1, 5. And who is the Davar? The Davar is known throughout the sages of Israel to speak exclusively about the Mashiach. Maybe now we start to get understanding why God was so angry. There's a real great principle in this. In this article called the, the, the Sfirot, according to, uh, uh, to Judaism, here's what Rabbi Rubin says. He says, by the word, by the way, when God created everything, what he did, he did what? He spoke. What is the Hebrew word for speaking? Vayedaber. Yedaber. It is a derivation of the word davar. Here is what he says. By the word of the Lord, heaven made, right? He's quoting the scripture. Speak on the words which come from the mouth of Hashem. This, this, this is called in Hebrew kol. Kol is the word for voice. And the words he spoke is Dibu. So in essence, he said that the entity that created everything, who is it? It's God through his speech. And what is the speech? It's Dibu. Who is the Dibu? It's the Davar. Who is the Davar? He's the Mashiach. Do you want to know who is the creator of all things? It is the Messiah himself who created all things. Matter of fact, the Torah even tells us in, in the psalm, it says to us this. Psalm 33 says to us, By the davar of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them in the bread of his mouth. Who created heaven and earth, friends? It is the Mashiach. God has spoken, and what came out of God, because it is part of God, the Mashiach is part of God, right? I am the Father, are one. What came out of God is the words. What is the word for words? It's Dibu. And what's come out of it is the word Davar. The living word. Yeshua HaMashiach. Are you guys following me? I know it's a lot of Hebrew for one day, but you're exercising your Hebrew. <laughs> Almost done. So now we get a clue. Why is it? Let me go back. That God was so upset. God said in his mitzvah, Vedibartem el asela. He wanted Moses. By the way, do you know Moses calling in the Torah? Have you ever seen this expression? Moses calling the Torah, man of God. Ish a Elohim. Everybody saw it. Moses calling the Torah, man of God. Do you know why Moses called man of God? 
Anybody know why Moses called man of God? There's a midrash on Psalm 90 that says that Moses, from his waist all the way, all the way up, he was completely divine. And from his waist down, he was completely human. You want to know if, if Judaism believed in a divine age? Is God taking a divine form? Absolutely. Moses was a quasi-divine in Judaism. But God wanted him to do what? He wanted him to speak it. Why? Who is the Davar? Who is the creator of everything? Mashiach. It is Mashiach. And instead of giving the honor to the Messiah, the Dibartem el Asela, he tried to credit his own self. Inadvertently. But there is a principle, a kingdom principle for us to take today. If we put Mashiach, the Dibartem el Asela is a principle of the kingdom to let the Davar let Yeshua be first. Amen. I am going to tell you something that will be honor and blessing to our God like you have never seen before. Amen. But for the second we think that we can take anything upon ourselves and we can do anything outside of him, even if the results are okay, it's become what Shaul says. It is the work of the flesh. Are you following this principle? It is important principle. So really, the Torah says to us, the very first commandment, pru urbu, be fruitful and multiple, multiply. The question asks that do we want our actions here in Shoresh David, in your marriage, in your testimony and witness, do you want them to be a lasting? Do you want them to be a lasting testimony to the world around you? Or do you want just to Take any old action by hitting the rock. We have two options. We either go all in for Yeshua. And we speak in Yeshua when we rise up, when we walk, when we lay down. As the Shema commanded us. Or we're just going to just do a bunch of actions. You see, that's the division between us and the, and the Jewish community. They do a lot of good works too. The Muslims do a lot of good works. Some of the atheists do quote unquote mitzvahs too. The difference between us as a messianic believer is are we willing to let God do the supernatural naturally by speaking it, letting Yeshua be center and believing that he can do all things when we call upon his name. This is a question. Numbers 1 says this. I believe this is a historic moment for our movement today. This day even. Numbers 1 said the following. From 20 years. This is, this is at the beginning of the book of Numbers. It says from 20 years old and upwards. All are able to go forth to war in Israel. You shall number them to a host. Even thou and Aaron. And then verse 4, and with you there shall be a man in of every tribe, everyone had the father house. And these are the names of the men that shall stand with you. Of Reuven. So when they give us all the, the laundry list of all the people, I want you to pay attention to the Hebrew here. The word Ve'ele Ashemot. The term Ve'ele Ashemot is a term of emphasis. He says, here are the people. We're going to take you forward. And their names are remembered forever. How do I know that those people are remembered for, uh, forever? Because their name is in the book. And I want to tell you something. If they would not have gone before me, I wouldn't be here. Ron, you wouldn't be around either. None of us from the 12, 12 tribes would be around. Because somebody had to go before us. The Ele Ashemot is a mitzvah that God is giving us to us. These are the name. Some of you in the room here today are between. Some of you ran the race already. Some of you the beginning of the race. Some of you finishing the race. But I want to tell you something. As long as you are alive today, there is a race to, to be running 
It is not over until God says it's over. And the only way to run the race is by saying, Let God be a supernatural God in your life. This is the only way to do it. Talking about supernaturality. When I came to faith, I recall there was a Shiva service for me. They equipped their clothes for me. And they, they sent the rabbi. That was the, the process of things. The greatest persecutor that I had in my own family was my mother. She was a Holocaust survivor. Fifteen years later, from this incident, fifteen years, almost sixteen years went by. Uh, my mother went when she, she's in Israel and. Uh, I shared with her the gospel for many years. And um, she called me in Passover exactly two years, uh, two years, two years ago. And she said, uh, I, I called her, you know, there are two days for Pesach. Call first night, say, Mom, just think about the, kapa, the, the, the blood, you know, the blood on the, on the doorpost. That's it. I didn't say nothing. She called me the next day. She said, I saw him. I said, Mom, who did you see? So you know who I saw. I said, Mom, that sounds crazy. Just don't talk like that. That's crazy talk, Mom. I said, no, I really saw Yeshua. He is there, and he is real. And all your years of praying for me, you don't worry about it, son. Because I received him last night in the dream. And he's Lord. And he is Lord. And I want to tell you something. There was nothing about me. It's me expecting the supernatural. Amen. And believing in this. Amen. They called me two days later. And it was, you know, total Holocaust Memorial Day. I've been working with Ted Pierce on those Holocaust uh, uh, marches. And they invited me. They invited me. Uh, to do a, 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 a memorial service in a place that is have the Ku Klux Klan flag still in the city, okay, to give you understand it. But like, what am I going to say about the Holocaust? I didn't experience the Holocaust. And my mother, actually, I called her and said, Mom, listen, can you tell me what to say, really? So I want to read to you a few words of my mother. And you understand the significance of this for this message. She wrote this. My name is Esther Friedman Shapira. I was born in Vilna and I'm the last survivor of my whole family from the Holocaust. I have two children in Israel and a son in Texas. That's me. I also have three grandchildren. In the name of my father, Moshe Friedman, in the name of my mother, Tipora Friedman, in the name of my memory of my sister, Rivka, and two brothers, Alter Ken Reuven, we will never forget those who were taken away from my parents and those who never saw them again. I will never forget how my father was crying and screaming at nighttime. I will never forget. My mother was handicapped. The Nazis were broken her arms and legs, never put it in a cast. They try experimental shots on her, and because of that, she got the nerve disorder, and therefore she was always shaking. One month before she died, she had a panic attack from the memories of the Nazis. This is something that we should remember and never forget. After what my family and I went through, I still believe that the world can be a better better place for all of us. It doesn't matter what color or race or religious background you carry. Let's make sure that this will never happen again. Let's remember my father, Moshe Fried, my, my mom, mother, Tipor Fried, and the six in million innocent Jews who were murdered for nothing. In love, Esther Shapira. The second I finished this sermon, my phone rang. And they told me right at this moment that my mother went to be with the Lord the exact second that this was the last word. So this was the last call that I had with my mother. And she said this to me. Make sure that whatever we do have a lasting impact on the, on the people to come. So I immediately flown to Israel. 
I immediately flew to Israel. And I wouldn't say my mother lived a godly life at all. She didn't. Okay? A lot of it is because of what she'd been through. But we flew to Israel and I could not mourn because I was already mourning when I read this letter. And I knew exactly where she is. She is, she is with Mashiach in heaven. I knew where she is. And I stood there and I have a brother who is an observant Jew and a sister who is an atheist. So guess who they let to do the funeral? They picked the messianic. So that was a great thing. And I read from 1 Corinthians in the 14th chapter. And every eye was crying. There were hundreds of people, hundreds and hundreds of people. Until somebody says, which poet did you just read from? I said, ah, oh, it's not that important, the poet. Names, names. Let's not worry about this. I said, well, his name is Shaul, if you must know. What a great Jewish. Shaul who? Shaul of Tarshish. And he says, ah, oh, let's do a funeral service to you now, too. So uh, we're pretty close to having my, my funeral service at the same time. But let me tell you, hundreds of people have heard the gospel because my mother decided to speak the name of Yeshua in the last day of her life, friends. Hundreds, hundreds heard about Yeshua because of the decision she made to become sanctified. Remember the scripture, Leviticus 28? She, became, she sanctified herself in the last day of her race. And that was enough to make a lasting impact. How much more you and I can make an impact today because this is not our last day, God willing. How much more can we do? How much we can do if we speak to the rock? If we speak the name of Yeshua? If we believe? If we expect? If we go to the Jewish people? How much more? Matter of fact, when I finished, you know, after the Shiva, the last thing I wanted to do, the last thing I wanted to do in Israel, to go back to my, I was raised in the Orthodox synagogue, to go to the Orthodox synagogue. And I walk in there, I was shell-shocked. Because you don't walk in there. It's not like your old synagogue, everybody hugging and kissing when you walk in. It doesn't work like this in a Sephardic uh, community. There are ten synagogues, and each one competes with one another. And they compete who can chant, can't louder. They have megaphone. Ta da! You know, Shabbat is so cool walking there. And the guy see me in giant. David sir says, Who are you? I'm like terrified to come in. I knew the anti missionaries were going to get me. I'm saying to myself, you know. And I give the last name. You give your last name. They need to validate your last name is okay, the last name. So I give the last name. And. You say, okay, you come in, but you be in the corner. So I'm going, I'm terrified, walking in the corner. And the way they read the Torah, if there is a mistake, they stop the reading and they correct the person. And it's a bar mitzvah there. And they said, do you want to do a Torah aliyah? Like, no, we'll be here all night, you know, all day. And I see the little boy with his bar mitzvah. And I remember, because that's the synagogue where I had my bar mitzvah. Women upstairs, men downstairs. And they shoot the candy at him. The, the poor soul is just shell-shocked. This boy looked just traumatized. And I just can remember my bar mitzvah just being traumatized like this too. You know, Melech, Moshiach, Baruch Atah, Magen Avraham. The shield of Abraham is the Torah. You duck with the candy. You know what I'm talking about. Oh, I remember my bar mitzvah very well. When a candy hit me here and knocked me down. But then the guy come, the same guy that was so mean, and start kissing on me. And I'm not talking like a, a polite kisses, those smoochy kisses, you know. <laughs> Hugging, bearing, loving, mushy stuff. Like what has happened? What just took place here? And then he takes me. And he brings me right, uh, the way the synagogue structure is a, it's a square. Torah is in the middle, right in front of the Torah. Don't move now. I'm like, I'm terrified. This is, must be a trap. I can see it. I'm going to be murdered in the synagogue. <laughs> and then he said, wait till the rabbi come. So I wait and wait and wait and wait and the rabbi come. 
And the rabbi says to me, do you know why you are here? In this particular seat. And I said, I have no idea. Please tell me. He said, you really don't know why you are in this seat? I'm like, seriously, I have no idea. And he said, I want you to get on your knees. You know, it's like um, benches that are kind of mounted. And he said, I want you to look at the bench you're sitting on. And I look down, I see nothing. He said, no, I want you to get on the floor and look like that. You know, what's written? Because there's something special about this bench. And I look, and there's an inscription inside the bench. You know, my name is Itzhak. Itzhak is Itzhak. Itzhak Shapira. It says, this seat has been purchased for life for Itzhak Shapira by Itzhak Shapira. Itzhak Shapira is my grandfather. And he's been my hero, really. He teach me Torah. He teach me everything I know. And he, sa- he, w- he knew that one day I will return back. And he wanted me to have the best seat in the house for his grandson. This is last, this affected my life drastically. I have more zeal now than ever to speak about Yeshua because what is has been imparted unto me. And these are the names. This is the people who went before me who have given me something. How much more Yeshua has given us even with this greatness of what my grandfather did to me. How much more does Yeshua have given us a lasting covenant entry to the world to come Shalom. How much more should we make the best seats to the Jewish people here by speaking to them about Yeshua? How much more should we do? God has called you for this time. God has equipped you to this time. God has strengthened you for this time. This is the time. This is the time, Shoresh David, to have revival among our people. 